Good morning, everybody. My name is Bethany Miller, and I am coming to you um, as part of CE Nationals Digital Labs. And I am very excited that we are in the midst of a series of digital labs specifically aimed at women in ministry, whether you are a pastor's wife or ministry wife or serving in ministry yourself, any of those roles. We're just really excited that you would join us for this series and hopefully find great hope and encouragement um, in your role in serving. Um, and today's topic might apply to you personally. It may apply to you in, in ministry and the people you serve. Um, whatever that situation may be, we are so honored and privileged that you would join us today. Um, I am also extremely privileged to welcome my dear, dear friend, Karen Amendola, uh, to join us today. And we are going to have a conversation today on a very heavy topic about abuse. Um, and this is a topic that we cannot go deep enough in the short time that we have. So we know that we are just going to scratch the surface today. But our true, our true hope here is that we would be able to offer hope to those who would be listening, the hope of healing that comes in Christ. Um, and this is a topic that Karen, um, I would say, is an expert in, has done a lot of research and study and education. She's a speaker on um, this topic to ministry leaders. And so I wanted to ask her in to share her expertise with us. And so um, she is also a personal friend of mine, and I know the deep heart she has to help women, and really women or men, um, but to help everyone through this topic. So Karen, I'm going to uh, just turn it over to you and ask you to give us a brief introduction of yourself, um, kind of your journey in ministry that has led you to this point, and how has this topic of abuse become um, part of your ministry and such a passionate part for you? Thanks, Beth. I'm excited to be here and uh, tell you a little bit more, more about myself, do some education on abuse. Uh, Probably I should let you know I'm a uh, mental health counseling student. I'm getting my master's in mental health counseling just because this uh, helping people walk through life's hurts has become such a big part of uh, my passions and what I like to do, whether you're a church leader or um, just a member of a church. So there's that. I um, work for Global Training Network, which is a missions organization that trains church leaders in the majority world. My husband and I do that here in New York City because of uh, the diversity that is here. Um, I am also a ministry coach for our denomination, which is a network of churches that I dearly love. And I work for Mending the Soul, which is an organization committed to helping people heal from trauma and abuse. So that's what I do, some of the hats that I uh, wear and have worn. Um, now you want me to tell you about how I got involved in this. Um, yeah, that's a story. So well, it's a hard like, hey, briefly tell me your life story. It's, yeah. it's a little bit of a hard question to answer. So. I got a lot of life, girl. That's why it's <laughs> OK. But while I'm doing this, I'm sorry, I'm going to point this out. I, this is just so distracting to me. Our house is under construction. It's been under construction for about a year. We've done a lot, but these are wires hanging down. It's not some fancy light picture or weird picture, but <laughs> I just thought I'd call it out because it's there right behind my head. There you go. We're all, we're all at home. We're all in mayhem in 2020. So true. So true. In the background. <laughs> okay, so how did I get here? I will have to say I'm going to start with my own personal story because that's what's connected with it. Um, I became a believer when I was younger and uh, in high school and saw God do some radical things in my life, in my school. And by a, an early age, probably by the time I was a senior, I really felt called to full-time ministry. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was like, what better privilege can I have to give people the same opportunities I have to hear the gospel, to hear the life-changing message of Jesus, to disciple other people? Um, so... Yeah, that time really influenced my life. So I went to college and went to join staff with Campus Crusade. And it was there that I met my husband and we got married and uh, eventually went on staff with the Campus Crusade crew, as it is now called. So we were in full-time ministry and we added kids along the way. Um, 
And we always had some struggles with not just communication, normal stuff, but there was intimate issues that we struggled with. Uh, I didn't know how to navigate that. He didn't know how to navigate that. So, but we just did our best, right? You just, you know, had mentors, you pray, you work out your conflict and, and all of those things. So that's kind of one part that's just keep that in the background. So um, in the middle of our church plant, we planted a church from our, our home church. That first year was like, hmm, this is really going to be a lot of work and kind of had set our mind for that. And for those of you who are, you know, I think you said mostly pastors, wives, right, Beth? Our, our pastors, you guys know what a lot of work that is. Um, so I was prepared. Okay, a season of hard work. And we were working with, we were doing marriage counseling because, you know, you meet with people who have struggles. And we were doing premarital. We had a season of a bunch of our students that we had mentored when they were in high school that were now getting married. And what I found was that inevitably, as we engaged in their lives in a, in a real way, we found that most of the women had experienced some form of abuse and so had the men. And during this first year, uh, it really started taking a toll on me personally. And I really started to get angry, just angry at the hurt, angry at the injustice, the unfairness and the being taken advantage of and seeing the, the ramifications of that. So, um, and where it started turning is when I started thinking like, man, men are jerks. And, you know, I knew that that wasn't a godly thought or feeling. Right. So I would work through that, right? I would confess that my sin and I would memorize scripture and, but how that wound up flushing out is I became very sensitive. Uh, I would say probably oversensitive to the injustices, especially done by men in authority, whether it be a husband or a pastor. And hey, I'm married to a man, right? So uh, it started to flesh out in our marriage where I'd be really sensitive to John and my reactions to him, my, my anger was overreacted. So, uh, but because I, I know God's word and I have had good relationships, I, I use my spiritual principles, prayer, scripture memory, confession, going to, you know, um, John and asking for forgiveness. Also during the same time though, I started feeling very isolated, isolated from other people. And I remember thinking something's not right here because my spiritual principles are not, the things I always used aren't working anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt kind of stuck. I didn't really have the words for it then, but that's what I would say I was stuck. And then I feel bad. It was a horrible cycle. I'm so, what's the matter with me? Why can't I get a handle on this? Those kinds of thoughts, um, which then I later learned was, you know, part of the enemy's plan to shame me into this self-defeating cycle. But so I called a friend and she is uh, actually one of the founders of Mending the Soul that I'll mention later. And she said, oh, you know, let me connect you with one of my, my colleagues. And I started going to therapy which was in my, raised my um, church culture in the past was kind of a taboo. You just, you just don't trust, you know, a therapist. But this gal, I knew she loved Jesus. She knew the word. And wouldn't you know about the third time, the third session in there, my abuse came up, which I didn't even know was abuse, but I was just, you know, describing my childhood. And my therapist questioned me, well, what, what would you say, you know, to someone, if they told you the story you just told me, think of somebody that was your age as, at the time. And I thought of my niece, Nicole, and I thought if she came to me and told me about what I experienced, I, I, w I just couldn't even get any more words out. And I started boohooing like a baby. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened to me all those years ago was hurtful. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea I had it locked away i didn't know the degree but when i looked at it was from somebody else's perspective and thought of somebody who i dearly love it became so evident and that really started a, a, a whole process of me unpacking the hurt from my past um, and finding healing and along with that my dad had suddenly died when he was when he was young and you know beth all of this i thought i'd already dealt with and Jesus had changed my life so much. So that's why it was really hard to reconcile 
um, the two, but it really helped me to connect the dots. And so what therapy did for me and Mending the Soul helped me to be authentic, to be integrated, to be honest with myself, to be honest with God and other people and specifically uh, my relationship with John. Um, and it changed the way our, my husband's relationship, it changed. I never knew how much intimacy we didn't have until I went through this. And then it changed the way that we did ministry, providing a safe environment for leaders to get to know one another, to fail, to heal together. Um, and so that's ultimately how I became involved was through my own personal journey. And after being meeting so many other people who had experienced um, different forms of abuse. Yeah. Well, thank you, Karen. Um, I want to thank you for being willing to be honest and vulnerable with us today, um, because I think that your story is probably going to be very powerful for those who hear it. I know it has been in the past, and so I, I hope today through this platform it can also be powerful for people, because I think some of the things that you're talking about are so common for us as women right. to shame ourselves for the things that have happened or the responses that we have. I shouldn't be that way. I shouldn't act that way. I shouldn't think that. Um, and and some of that maybe is, is just our makeup of as women, um, but I think important for us to really take an examination of that and say, where is this coming from? Because those are those thoughts of shame and those shameful thoughts that we bring on ourselves are not from our father God. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, to find a healthy path forward where we can proclaim his truth of the things he does say about us as his children and his daughters and, and how much he loves us. So, um, so thank you so much. I do, you, you mentioned there right at the end, the different forms of abuse. So I do want to yeah. ask, you and and give some clarification for our listeners that as we say abuse that's a very large term mm -hmm. um, that there are a variety of types of abuse and so um, you and I had talked before and I just want to let our listeners know we're going to provide kind of some or you're going to provide for us some uh, general definitions of abuse but we want to also be clear that um, these are very general definitions and that again we're, we're scratching the surface and that just because your experience doesn't match one of these word for word, it doesn't mean that whatever your story is, it isn't valid and doesn't, um, doesn't warrant the attention and the healing that you might need for it. So again, just kind of as a caveat to providing some of this general framework. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, and I, I think what I'll do, <clears throat> I'll just name the categories, the general categories, excuse me. <clears throat> And then we'll come back and give them what they look like because the definitions do vary, you know, uh, slightly. But what is important to remember is that the center of abuse is power and control. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about that, just keep that in your brain. It's like that's the, the hub of abuse. So there's verbal and emotional abuse. There's physical abuse or domestic violence. <clears throat> there's neglect, which is often um, not talked about as a form of abuse in Christian circles. Uh, spiritual abuse, again, not often talked about in Christian circles, um, and sexual abuse. And then there's also an aspect of narcissistic families uh, mm -hmm. that we can talk about. And there's so much that we could say, like, I'm like, okay, what's the best way to go about this? I, I, so, part of, such a big topic in such a short amount of time. All right. So here's what I'm going to say. Some verbal and emotional abuse, there's threats and intimidation. Uh, they, can ver they can threaten physically. They can name call demeaning statements, per, uh, phys um, publicly embarrassing uh, uh, a loved one or not, it doesn't have to be a, uh, propositions, sexual uh, harassment, verbal sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. um, so those are harder, I, you know, let me just go on and then I'll, I'll come back and clarify. Um, put downs, correction, ignoring, you, you know, you, let's say your spouse says, you know, this is really important to me. That person consistently ignores uh, mm -hmm. that that person's needs. Um, entitlement, attitudes of entitlement, mm -hmm. that the uh, abuser puts themselves above that person. So that's a verbal. 
physical, uh, you know, that's more obvious, right? But it's, it's shoving, pushing, pinching, uh, hair pulling, things like that. It could also be um, where somebody has threatened you sometime, one time physically, and then they use that to keep that person uh, in the back of their mind to keep them under control so that there's some fear there. Uh, sexual abuse is, again, it's broad. And all of these are a continuum, right? From, uh, I'm not gonna say minor, but less severe to severe because all abuse is hurtful. Uh, it can be suggestions, it could be exposure, it could be touching. It doesn't have to be all the way to intercourse or rape, but there's a whole continuum of that. Um, what else? Uh, oh, spiritual. It's just generally using somebody using their spiritual authority to get their desired result um, for not for the other person's best interests. That would be a general thing for spiritual authority. Um, not using their spiritual authority to not listen, to not hear somebody's story, to discount somebody's story. Um, those are also some examples of spiritual abuse. Let's see, what else? Neglect. Neglect is horrible as well. And it's, it's the quieter abuse, right? Not taking, it's of course the basics, not having food or shelter, but not taking care of somebody's um, emotional needs. Uh, there's a lack of nurture, a lack of connection, and that person is just kind of on their own or that child is on their own. Yeah. Um, there's economic you know, abuse where somebody manipulates and controls all the money in a household, mm -hmm. um, doesn't give, uh, there's no sharing there of finances and uh, financial responsibility. Oh gosh, that's it, a lot right there. Yeah, I, I do want to ask, because you mentioned um, the narcissism. Um, oh, yeah. That may be one that folks aren't as familiar with. Can you say a little more? Yeah, about that? yeah. so narcissism is, well, the, the thing that you would classically know is all about me, right? Mm -hmm. So everything circles back around to that person. You know, other people's perspectives can't, they can't be seen. It's all about that person. And then in a narcissistic family, it's a lot of keeping everything under the hood, so to speak. It's, you know, we don't, we don't share this. Everything stays quiet. And it is, uh, you know, self-focus, but it's more than that. It's, it's, again, it's a way of controlling uh, the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Does that and make I, sense? Yeah. And I think you mentioned that at the beginning, that really the root of all of these various, you know, these various avenues, for lack of a better word, that it can take, um, that root that you mentioned of control and power. And, and I do see that as, as that hierarchical, it's putting somebody, it, keeping somebody under power and control is the, the effort of the abuser, whether they realize it or not, because I do think sometimes it's not even a conscious act, but it's a messy situation, but that it, it keeps that control and power situation in place. Is that, would that be accurate to say? Yeah, I would agree because as you're talking, I think, well, the opposite of that is equality, right? Mm -hmm. So are you equally respected and heard? And yeah. if we're talking about childhood, even as a child, children are people too. So as a child, were you respected? Were you heard? Were you cared for? Um, so those are things to consider when we're, when we're talking about abuse. Yeah. So with that, as we move forward in the conversation, again, I want to thank you for being willing to share your story. And I know that you know so many stories from the work that you've done. I do want to just make our listeners aware that we will not be talking about any particular story. Um, and that is out of the utmost respect of the confidentiality of the women that Karen has served or men, um, whoever your clientele have been, um, that we 
we won't even talk about them in anonymous stories. We just want to be really cautious of protecting folks' confidentiality and, and their willingness to work with you and, and be open with you with their stories. So I am gonna ask you about some general trends you've seen, but it's certainly not asking for stories. Okay. Um, and so with that, I just was curious that, with the women that you've worked with in particular, um, can you share some of the general trends that you've seen or even that you've learned about in your own research and training of what are the effects of um, women who have experienced abuse or trauma in their past and how that can affect them in the future years later? You spoke in your own story about the feelings of isolation and the feelings of um, self-shaming and even how that affected your marriage and things. So those are a couple examples. What are other things that you see um, that women deal with well into the future? Yeah, okay. So I think what I'll start is with general. What happens uh, with abuse is we find ways for self-protection. Uh, as children, those things are God-given because, you know, just we don't know any better and we're just trying to protect ourselves from harm. So, but we grow uh, into adulthood with strategies of self-protection that can morph and be hurtful, right? Mm -hmm. So what I see is um, we find ways of trying to meet our needs uh, that are apart from Christ. And sometimes we don't recognize that why we're doing what we're doing, but we recognize the behavior is wrong. So for example, for me, my anger, I knew my anger was inappropriate. I couldn't get a handle and I was stuck, but I didn't recognize it was connected to abuse. So um, some of the things that we see are people uh, trying to get power and control over their behavior through kind of react, reenacting what they did. So like if there's in sexual abuse, some women become overtly sexual uh, because it validates them to feel loved and approved and, and different other reasons. Um, some people become very uh, aggressive. You're not gonna hurt me. And so there's a wall of, of isolation. So while it keeps out the bad, it also doesn't let in the good, right? Um, there's like for, in my example, it was passivity until I couldn't take it anymore. And then I would blow up, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, because we mix that with our Christian understanding of what it means mm -hmm. to uh, love others, um, but really often it's, I'm just going to protect myself. So I'm just going to stay quiet and I'm going to just withdraw. Um, so a lot of passivity, a lot of compliance. So it usually has one side or the other compliance or aggression of certain, uh, different forms. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And again, I think, um, just as you were talking, I think I want to just make the note to anybody who might be listening. Um, we're not faulting anyone for those reactions. Um, yeah. Talking, this is, you know, just generally speaking, this is what can happen. And I think um, given the types of abuse that we're talking about, the stories and, and the experiences that people have, those can be very understandable reactions. Um, and as you said, it can really draw out of those experiences of trying to protect self, which is a natural reaction. Um, so that said, we also know that people don't have to be stuck. Um, and, and you yourself talked about that you had been stuck, but had found avenues and ways to move forward. So we've touched on it a little bit, but I, I want to really dive into that. What is the hope for moving past that place? If we have someone listening, who's just going, yeah, I'm stuck in that. And this happened to me and this is how it affects me now. What does that look like for the future? What are, what are the options and, and what's the hope there? Uh, I I do want to talk about that. I wanted to go back real quick as I was thinking more about this, uh, about the disconnection, right? So w there's this shame that I am no good, mm -hmm. or there's something the matter with me, or I'm broken. Uh, there's powerless and deadness. I have no voice. Uh, you know, everybody else, sometimes it looks like everybody else is more important than me. I'm just going to stay quiet. The deadness is uh, not really having the full range of emotion. It's, uh, it's you know, your, your emotions stay in this level. You're not really excited. You're not really grieving. You know, it's just uh, kind of flat, I would say, in that. Um, and sometimes it's denying our emotions. 
you know, denying how we really feel. I know part of that was part of that for me. Um, and I already spoke about the disconnection being, being isolated so that nobody really knows the true me. And I will say that part is the part that is most exciting to me, which brings me to the hopeful part is as we connect and face the pain of our past, or as we're helping other people face the pain of their past, uh, that person experiences healing and really gets to rediscover the way that God has wired them. Um, so important uh, to know. And that is, that's the hope that we bring is not just managing out external behaviors, mm -hmm. but going beyond that. And that's what I mean why sometimes people, you know, sometimes, sometimes as believers, we judge another person's behavior. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean it's not wrong, but we don't know their story. Right. We don't know their story. And sometimes that person doesn't really know how the dots connected. And it's so important uh, to not point finger, fingers and, and to pray for that person. Um, hopefully that person would get connected with some things that really help, really help them beyond just uh, discipleship. Mm -hmm. Not that discipleship's not bad. I'm not saying that. It's good. <laughs> It's a wonderful thing. Yes. Yeah. But, but there might be something more needed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So now I apologize. So now can we go, re, re, if you wouldn't mind re repeating the question. About that. Not at all. And I don't know that I'll say it exactly the same, but essentially okay. just talk about that hope. What, what is the hope to move past that place of, right. of being stuck, of, of experiencing or maybe even re-experiencing um, the trauma of your past, um, or, or even if it's today, um, yeah. the, the lasting effects it can have, how can, can women who have, who have been victims of abuse, what is the hope to move past that? Not to ignore their story, or right. as you said, I think that's key, you said, not to manage behaviors, but to truly find hope and freedom from the trauma that's occurred to them. Right, right. Okay, so if I lift, if I leave something out, you know, just ask me a question or whatever, because that's that's a lot, right? So <laughs> you have to face your pain. What often we do is we go, oh, I don't want to look at that, and we memorize scripture, we get an accountability partner, all that. That was my mo, right? This is your ministry. You want to honor God, and these people who are coming to church or coming to small groups they have a love for God. At the very least, they have a curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. So, but we get it in our mind, we shouldn't acknowledge that or confess it and get rid of it, right? Mm -hmm. I have learned uh, to do the opposite. To face it and go, what is going on? Why? And, and why, why am I having this reaction? And, and connect with God over that instead of just confessing it and getting rid of it which isn't bad, but it, it, it's kind of shallow. It's, it's saying, God, I don't like this. This doesn't feel good. Or God, I recognize this behavior is wrong. Show me what's going on. And then taking that with him and saying, you know, what were my thoughts and feelings that led up to that? And is this, have I noticed this before? Is this a pattern? And then, um, so that's the start. And what I would say is we shouldn't do it alone. We need safety. We need either a safe community, mm -hmm. uh, a small group, mm -hmm. a therapist. Is it's we're not meant to live this life on our own. We're meant to be connected with one another, but it has to be someone who's safe, someone who you can process with, who you know is not going to judge you, someone who's not going to try and just manage your behavior. Oh well, yeah, you know what you need? You need to memorize these verses, and you should do this, and you should. No, that is not what somebody who's experienced abuse needs. Somebody who's experienced some form of abuse, whether it's, you know, capital A, like very traumatic or small A where it's chronic, you know, over mm -hmm. time, which is just as damaging sometimes more, um, needs somebody to hear their story, mm -hmm. hear their story and cry with them and empathize with them for the hurt. So that's the first part of healing actually, Beth, is facing that pain in safe community and then giving it a name saying what it is and this is really hard 
I, you know, it took a lot for me to come to terms to say what I experienced uh, was abuse. Hmm. Yeah. Um, partly because some of it came from people that I loved. And I knew people who loved me and I don't think their intent was evil. I think they were just doing what they were taught and how they were treated, passing it down to us, but it didn't make it okay. And that's what I've learned, you know, over time is it doesn't make it okay. So you have to face it. You have to say what it is. We call it in mending the soul. We call it giving it a name because there's power in speaking out. This is what happened to me and it was hurtful. So you begin to unpack, unpack and unpack before you start uh, adding in, right? And it's as you unpack, you ask God to meet you in those deeper places. You know, first John talks about shining uh, the light and in him there is no darkness. And what we find is the more we unpack, the more we're bold and willing to face the gunk with God, the hurts and the sins, all of those things with God, the more he shines his light on them and we meet him in the deeper places and it, it provides such a um, uh, meaningful sanctification, uh, if that makes sense. And then when you're in a safe, like with a, like say with a Mending the Soul group or a support group like Celebrate Recovery, or if you're doing a book study, something like that, you're with a bunch of people who are helping you to relearn what love and safety and respect look like. And that's a huge part of it. That's why I say it has to be done um, in some form of community, at least one other person. Yeah. And does I that love, make sense? It. yes, it does. And I love that you brought up that first John of shining the light because to be honest, that's why I wanted to bring this topic forward. Um, and in this series of digital apps, we're going to tackle some other really heavy, weighty topics. And I, I don't want us to shy away from them because my great hope is that God would shine his light um, and that he would do a great work where people could find the hope that he brings. Um, and, and I know that that can come in many avenues. And so I so appreciate um, you know what you're saying about community. I think that's key. Um, and yeah, being willing to get into some of that stuff that's deep in within us um, that we need to wrestle with. And we, the, the things that we're talking about are so heavy. I don't believe there's any quick fix to this. And we're not, not expecting that from anybody. Um, but that there is a pathway for um, walking with God, walking with Jesus, and, and those who also love him and and want to find that healing in him that he offers to find freedom and hope. And so I love that. Um, and with that, it kind of leads into what I was going to ask you about next is that, again, we want to through this shine a light. And I think that in the general church culture, there's a lot more openness to that today than there has been in the past. Definitely. But also just be honest and say that abuse has not had a prominent place in spotlight in church culture in, in the past. And I, I would even argue it's better today, but it's probably not where it needs to be. Um, and that we as churches, as ministry leaders, as, as people, frankly, even if you're just a congregant in the church, we as the church body can and should be seeking God's healing for anyone who's been hurt, whether it be abuse or some other story. Um, and so we shouldn't be shying away from this, um, this topic uh, from this journey. And so from your perspective, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, what you think we as, and I'm, I'm using the church as the very broad spectrum of the church under Christ, not any particular denomination or church body, um, but what can we as the church, the body of Christ do to better address this topic moving forward and better provide hope of Christ for um, folks who may have been a victim of abuse at any point along their life? I so appreciate that question because a big part of my job is educating people, church leaders, mm -hmm. about what constitutes abuse and uh, what we know statistically that abuse is rampant. And it's, the statistics are the same inside the church as outside the church. So we have really failed uh, a huge population of people in the church by ignoring it, uh, teaching part truth, not the whole truth, about respect and submission. Like with women's issues, we teach about res uh, submission. I know that was the culture I came from, so much on submission, but not on what respect looked like. Um, 
so many people that come to me that have shared their story um, with abuse within the church, often like with a sexual abuse situation with a leader or an elder, and the church has tried to just deal with it within the church. Uh, they say it's for the sake of Christ, but it's usually for the church's reputation. And there is a, an aspect of, because uh, I asked my husband about, you know, some of this as we were talking is, you know, why are church leaders so hesitant? And there is a, what I would say, um, and he said it, and I agreed, is an oversensitivity to false accusation. Mm -hmm. um, and then we kind of get into the wrong role. Yeah, can I just clarify on yeah. that and sensitivity in terms of um, a fear on the part of, of, of leaders that there might yes. be accusation? Yes, yes. And, you know, as men, they don't want to falsely accuse another man, let's say, in that they want to be careful, which is appreciated, right? But what we do then is we, we inadvertently disbelieve the victim. We inadvertently well, or advertently, we invalidate that person's story and experience. And both have to be taken seriously, right? So when somebody comes to you with an allegation of abuse, it has to be taken seriously. It doesn't mean you have to believe that person. Um, the other thing that we do as church leaders is we don't get the appropriate authorities involved. We try to figure out who's right, who's wrong, especially in cases of uh, marital dispute or uh, domestic violence. And I just, we can't say it enough. My, I'm say we, my husband and I, when we talk, get the authorities involved. They are trained. They will sift out the facts. We're this just there to support uh, right. and bring pastoral counseling to right. the hurting, not to determine who's right and who's wrong. Um, I think I got a little bit off topic. What was the other, <laughs> the other uh, part? No, I think, I think this is good. We're just kind of exploring this idea of how we as the church body and especially as ministry leaders how we can do this better moving yeah. forward uh, it, and I'm, I'm actually going to add a little something in there not just assisting victims of abuse though that is immensely important but i would argue perhaps more importantly how can we prevent abuse mm -hmm. from ongoing or from ever occurring what can we do to to you know, it's, it's like you said, that statistic of it's just as high within the church bodies outside. And that's right. unacceptable. And it should be unacceptable to any of us in the church. And so how do, how do we improve that so that there aren't people out there who right. are continuing to deal with the negative effects of abuse? Got it. That's such a great question, Beth. Oh, man, there, that could be just a whole seminar all in and of itself. Okay, well, I will say the first thing, what you're doing right now is a step in that direction right mm -hmm. having conversation having those difficult conversations church-wide uh abuse should be talked about from the pulpit uh on a fairly regular basis i know as a pastor's wife i know there's a lot of things that have to be talked about but when you depending on your style whether you're topical or expository when it's appropriate when abuse is demonstrated in a narrative Talk about it. When Jesus is reaching out to the children, to the leper, touching, physically touching a leper, talk about what that means in the context of the marginalized and how beautiful the love that God showed. Um, so talking about it in your small groups, in your one-on-one, -on -one, in your large group, in a natural context, uh, standing up for things that are wrong uh, when you see abuse of power training your children's workers, interviewing them, having background checks, uh, having standards in place so that children are not left alone with an adult. And those protections go both ways, right? Mm -hmm. It protects not only your children, but also protects your leaders. Um, those are some of the things that I think of off the top of my head and, um, and educating yourself, whether you have somebody come in to do seminars or just like we're doing, you know, right now with all the racial uh, trauma that's going on in the unrest, we're educating ourselves, right? Uh, learning more so yes. that we can be part of God's redeeming and healing kingdom. Yeah, yeah. 
I love that. And I, I want to give a quick plug. Um, in our last Digital Lab for Women, we were talking with Women of Grace USA, who's part of the CARES Fellowship, um, providing resources for women. And their executive director, Vicki Rife, did mention on that that they are going to be um, doing some trainings coming up. I'm not sure of all the details, but I just want to encourage our listeners to watch their um, a Facebook page or sign up for their newsletter or get in touch with them if you're interested, um, that they are going to be doing some um, really cool stuff on um, on trauma training. And so we want to be sure that those um, that, that that's available. So every ministry leader should get the opportunity to be part of trauma training and to better understand uh, what this, this stuff is, um, and what's going on and how they can use that to better serve our, our churches, um, both, and again, like I said, the church, the body of Christ as one whole, as well as their individual church body. So I would encourage our viewers to just watch for that information from Women of Grace on that trauma training or wherever you are to seek that out. Um, Karen, I'm also going to give you an opportunity to plug Mending the Soul Good. here. <laughs> yeah, please do it. In fact, I'll just turn it over. Okay. okay. I'm going to show you this book, Bending the Soul by Stephen R. Tracy. I don't get any money from this. I don't work for them. I'm just saying such a great textbook on all the aspects, the prevalence, the effects, and the healing along with this workbook uh, that was written by his wife, who's a therapist, Mending the Soul Workbook. You can get on their website, mendingthesoul.org, sign up for um, virtual healing groups. The beauty of virtual is that now they can be, uh, you can be from all over in the same group and it works even though my favorite is in person. Yeah. So um, yeah. I, I prefer in person too, but in this day and age, we will make the best of what we That's got. exactly right, sister. We will look for those silver linings. Um, and so we are thankful that at least we have this if we cannot have the in person. Um, and so, Karen, we've, we've talked about those two, you know, the upcoming trauma training through Women of Grace, Mending the Soul, which I know you're a leader of, and I have known other women who have either been leaders or gone through the program themselves, and I have heard nothing but incredible things about what a tool that can be in somebody's journey as they, as they wrestle with uh, the truth of their experiences. And so, are there any other resources that you would offer up? for um, someone who either kind of two different audiences, but one, if they've had abuse or trauma in their own past, or if they are looking to be an ally and a support to someone who has. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I will say one other thing about Many of the Soul. It is probably the best theological treatise I've seen, but it's also psychologically informed. Uh, so there's that beautiful combination of both. So um, important. Yeah, so, because sometimes we just try and treat abuse spiritually when it affects our whole person, and we need a whole person approach to that, yeah. um, which our spirituality is whole person, right? We're not just heads, and, you know, uh, we've got a, we got a whole body. Anyway, enough of that. So, yes, yeah. Celebrate Recovery is a great program. Uh, other resources like Wounded Heart by Dan Ellender are great, um, are really good. A book on feelings that I just love, which is a little bit more uh, heavy theologically, but Cry of the Soul by Tremper Longman and Dan Ellender. Just like, what is God's view of feelings? That was, a, that was just a game changer for me. Um, those are some resources off the top of my head. But if you are in a, if you're wanting to help other people walk through it, I would say get training through Mending the Soul. Mm -hmm. um, one thing to note, Beth, is there's this TED Talk by, and I, and I can email it to you, some of these resources when we're done, but by Nadine Burke Harris. She, at that time, I don't know what her position is. I still can't remember details, sorry. <laughs> but uh, she's in California, and she and another person did what is called the ACEs study, um, Adverse Childhood Experiences. It's 12 minutes. I think every person should watch it. And basically, it helps us understand how trauma affects us from childhood. And there's these different markers. I think there's 10. 10. But 67% of individuals in the US have experienced at least one traumatic event. If, if the, my number, if my memory serves me correct, which is a little eh, 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 but um, <laughs> it's a lot, the majority. And the amount of people who've experienced three and three traumatic events 
is huge and it affects our health. It affects the way we relate in relationships. And so that's why I'm so much of an advocate, no matter where you are, leader who wants to help or leader who is stuck, is to process your own pain first, your own history first, and start walking along or do it in conjunction. You guys walk along together as a small group of people because um, there's no hierarchy in God's economy. Right, right. And I'm glad you mentioned ACEs. Um, that's something that I hear a lot about in my profession in nonprofits um, mm. because so many nonprofits are serving people who, where ACEs is just, I won't even try to expound, but just to say that ACEs is a very important part of of nonprofit service for so many organizations. And so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I really do think it, the knowledge on it is starting to grow, but but can go a lot further. So yeah. I think that's great. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and plug here too. I do think, you know, you mentioned it earlier, but I just want to bring that back and, um, and say to our viewers that there is not only no shame, but I think we need to give great encouragement to people for seeking professional counseling. Um, and and, and I, I know I have experienced um, a couple of different times in my life, great Christian professional counselors who are trained and certified and that is their profession and their knowledge. And they have been immensely helpful in my own journey with any aspect of life that is difficult that we need to wrestle through, whether it's abuse or not. But I think especially when we're talking about something that is this hurtful and this heavy and can have such lasting effects, how important that is to seek that help. And so if you even have any inkling that you think that that would be helpful in your own life, I just want to put my own personal encouragement out there to seek that out um, and to find that. And we're going to have... Um, uh, we're going to talk about future digital labs, but I'm going to plug this one first, even before we get there of saying um, in October, we're going to be doing a digital lab on mental health. And we'll get into a lot more of the details of depression, right. anxiety, and we, we have some certified counselors who will be joining us for that to talk about that journey. So if that's of interest to you, just keep that in the back of your mind. We'll be talking about it more um, coming up. But um, Karen, I think it's really important to, before we end our conversation, um, that if there is anyone who's listening currently who is currently experiencing abuse or knows of someone who is, you said it earlier, but I'm going to ask again, what would you say to them? What do they need to do today? I would say call and get help. If it's domestic violence, uh, call the National Domestic Violence Hotline. You probably have local things, but national will get you the place that you need to be. Um, you can get the National Child Abuse Hotline. If you are concerned that there is a child in your care or in your purview that is experiencing abuse, don't turn a blind eye. So there's, you just have to Google it and there's a phone call away for the same thing. Suicide hotlines, anybody who is stuck or you know, somebody who you're concerned about, have the conversation with them. I'm concerned about you, what's going on, and then get them connected. Uh, just, uh, you know, just by Googling those national hotlines. Yeah, I think bottom line is reach out and get help. And there is great hope for healing yes. and for a future that's free of abuse. Yeah, yeah. and I am thank you, Beth, for bringing up about the therapy because I'm like, oh yeah, duh, it's so well, important. And we, we've said it a number of times, but I will say it again. We have taken an immense topic that we could spend days talking about for a very short period of time um, and tried to squeeze it down. So again, um, I think I just want to use this hopefully as a tipping point for some of our listeners as an opportunity to, you know, we've scratched the surface here, but we've also given you a lot of resources. There's a lot more out there. And I just encourage our listeners to educate themselves, whether that's for their own healing or for helping others to heal as well. Um, we wanna make sure that both of those are addressed. So um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. And again, Karen, thank you so much for being part of this. We're so appreciative of those who tune into our digital app.